Okay, so welcome everyone. Um, this afternoon we have uh, Graham Stanley with the webinar Gamifying um, the EFL course group. Okay, I'm going to read the bio, I mean, Graham's bio. Uh, Graham Stanley works for the British Council on Employment Teaching Children via, uh, uh, via video conferencing in Uruguay. He is the author of Language Learning with Technology from Cambridge University Press. Uh, he is a winner of SEU HRA Duke of Edinburgh, ELT Book of the Year, and co author of the Digital Play Computer Games and Language Aim. Okay, so let's please welcome Graham Stanley. Thank you. Thank you very much, Miguel. Can everybody hear me okay? Uh, Miguel, can you, do you have to move the slides on? Because I can't see how to do it. Okay, thank you. So, everybody, um, thank you for attending this presentation. Uh, it's a shame I can't see you all, um, but um, I'm going to go ahead and... Uh, continue be able to see me now um, so what I'll be talking about is gamification of <laughs> everybody that's nice to see everyone there uh, gamification of the ELP course book um, I think the slides don't show very well so the title should say gamification Gamifying the ELT course book. Um, so, what I'll be talking about is based on um, two sources. One of them is a website, a blog that I've been running now for several years with a colleague of mine, Kyle Moore, which is digitalplay.info/blog, and most of the lesson plans for the games that I'll be talking about today can be found there and all of the links to the uh, games can be found as well. Um, the other source is a book that I wrote with my colleague Carmo called Digital Play. It's similar to the blog. It's a more sort of distilled version of the blog. The blog is a bit messy. The book is more um, organized and it also has a, a section in which uh, explains why I think people should uh, use so teachers should use games in the classroom. I'm going to start with that. Um, basically, I think that um, digital games are worth using um, in the classroom because of several things. One of the things, one of the reasons is that now digital games have become a lot more popular and a lot more important uh, in a lot of our students' lives. So. This is a, a big reason. Just looking at the image on the screen there, you see there is so much now that has been written about games and uh, and also the games that uh, actually you find nowadays are incredibly sophisticated and are far more interesting than they were in the past. Um, the other thing to mention is that a lot of games have a lot of good learning principles in them, which I, I hope to show you at least some of that today. So the other reason is, I don't know about Venezuela, but certainly in the UK there are over one million gamers nowadays, and the average young person in the UK will spend around 10,000 hours gaming by the age of 21. Uh, this, come, this statistic comes from a great book I recommend by Jane McGonigal called Reality is Broken, which is all about games, not just computer games, but it certainly does include that. And I think this is one of the things. Games has become, have become, gaming has become one of the most popular things for people to do in their free time. And also the average age of the gamer is around 34 nowadays. So it's not something just for uh, teenagers as it was in the past. 
Right. The other thing about games these days is that there's a lot. There are a lot of games. One of them um, you can see on the screen at the moment, Beyond Two Souls, which came out in 2013, which are moving towards cinema quality, and a lot of games also, like Beyond Two Souls, have become very sophisticated as far as storytelling is concerned. And the interesting thing is that a lot of these games that people play, they, a lot of your students will spend many, many, many hours playing these games. And so the characters and the, uh, the worlds in these games will be far more, um, far more familiar to them than any uh, TV series or uh, film worlds or characters because of the amount of time they spend on them. Okay, moving on now. Why gamification? Well, gamification, which is using elements from game design in non-game uh, areas, um, is worthwhile using because I think it can be a way of motivating learners. And here you have several um, things displayed on the uh, screen which you can use uh, and which I have used in my classes when I worked in Spain in Barcelona um, with uh, students to make the course book more fun, for example. I'll look at a few of these now. So one of them is, is setting up a system of points, badges, and leaderboards. This BPL is, is sort of the more superficial version of gamification. But rather than give students, for example, uh, marks for each, um, each piece of work that they do. You might want to consider another way, which uh, is taken from uh, the idea of, of games, which is in games you don't get points which then you, you lose. For example, a lot of teachers give marks to students for uh, individual pieces of work, but they don't build up, they don't continue. So one of the things you can do is actually um, make these points that you give for the student's work increment. So one thing I did was a, a speed writing competition, whereas I spent uh, five minutes a class asking the students to write um, every class. And they would then count the number of words. And after I'd um, circle the mistakes, they would deduct the mistakes, and that would give them points. Uh, and various points would lead to different levels, and I would award them badges, the badges you can see on the, on the screen at the moment for that. And the idea was to try and motivate them to write, write more. It certainly did work. This was a group of 12-year-olds, but this is something that you could use for other classes as well. Here is a, a leaderboard, which I created uh, as well and displayed at the beginning of the, uh, the class. And a lot of the students I found were actually coming in and really wanted to see how they'd done the week before. So this is one of the first things I displayed when the students came in. As you can see, uh, as the weeks went on, they received uh, points for uh, the work that they'd done in their writing. And you can see that most of the students, uh, they reached uh, quite high levels. In, the, in other words, they, uh, they wrote quite a lot of, of words. And this was a class which uh, really didn't like writing. And so I found that at least over, well, over half of the students were motivated to write more because of this. Um, however, it didn't work for everybody. If you look carefully at this, uh, this board, you'll see that some of the students, for example, Patricia is one of them, after the third week, her level of writing, the number of words that she wrote went down. Um, and there were a couple of other students as well. Um, so there was something there that I had to fix, um, which we can also help by looking at games. Because one of the things that games do very well is that they don't just have one linear way of um, tracking achievement. They have several different um, uh, ways going on at the same time. So apart from the number of points that I awarded, the levels that were given to the students for their writing, I also gave separate achievement awards. Uh, here you can see um, special badges for being the most original um, in the class, having the fewest mistakes, 
which meant that the person who did that was perhaps not writing so quickly, but was actually writing very accurately, being creative or having the best introduction. And so introducing this, um, if I go back to the last slide, after the third uh, week, you can see that that inspired some of the students who were not writing so much to actually uh, become a bit more motivated. I think this is one of the things, another thing you can learn from games is that if you uh, have several different scoreboards or ways of um, rewarding the students at the same time, uh, then there are lots of different ways of telling them that they're winning, if you like, which is motivating for the students who perhaps are not good at one, one way, for example, writing uh, the most number of words, but uh, you can reward these students for other things if you find out what they're good at, so being creative, etc., or having few mistakes. And that was something that I learned when uh, doing this. So, so that's a, a speed writing competition that I ran. I ran it for one term. I think it was something that it wasn't worth running for a whole year. It worked well for a term, but it wouldn't have actually worked, I think, uh, the whole year. That's one of the things you have to uh, be careful about when you introduce these into your um, classroom. Um, and another way of uh, gamifying writing that I found, which works very well with young learners, is a web tool which is... Um, on the board at the moment, and that is a web tool that uh, was uh, created by um, Scholastic. So if you go to scholastic.com, something called Story Starters, what it involves is that it's a spin the wheel thing. So in, I won't, I can't show you these uh, live because uh, um, of the internet connection, really. But what you do is you click on the spin the wheel, and it randomly uh, selects some uh, certain uh, descriptions and what you would do with the students is either give different students uh, the option to write different stories you choose uh, a genre so on the top right hand corner you can see different genres adventure fantasy science fiction scrambler which is just a various thing and then if we look at the main screen which it says story sort of sci-fi so the science fiction story um, and then as you spin the wheels, it tells you um, what the stories should be about. So here we have write about something funny that happened to a popular world leader who has never seen the sun. And of course, you can spin the wheels individually. So if the students don't like what uh, has been selected, you can change any one of them. So that way you negotiate the topic of the story of the week, if you like. And it's a really fun way to get students, uh, particularly young students, motivated enough uh, to write something, which is a variation of something that may appear in the course book. Okay, moving on um, from this form of gamifying writing, another simple reward system that I've used is just uh, having money in my pocket. And this is something that I've used, again, with younger students, with 12-year-olds, um, as a way of motivating them to speak English in the classroom. So what I did was I actually rewarded them with um, Graham Euros, and here you have the Graham Euro that I photocopied for them. I would have done this in black and white, but here's the color version. And gave out uh, a number of these Graham Euros uh, to students for, um, for things that they'd done. And then what I would do is, if they spoke Spanish in the classroom, I would take away Graham Euros. And if they... Um, their classmates called out their, the other classmates for speaking Spanish, then I would give those Graham Euros to the students uh, who'd uh, called out their, their colleagues, their, their classmates. So this was a way of creating a sort of English-only environment in the classroom, which worked very well. And as soon as someone started Spanish, speaking Spanish to one of their classmates, the other classmate would, would tell me, and then I would take away the money from them and give it to the other one. It worked very well. I'm not quite sure how long it would have worked, but it certainly worked well for about uh, a term. So that's another simple way of introducing some kind of uh, currency 
to gamify the classroom. This was all done through, um, I decided to do this because of a survey that I'd done at the, back, at the beginning of term. So I gave them the survey and I found that what the, um, the results of that survey at the beginning of the term, um, which I asked them how, you, how they felt about doing various things related to skills in the English classroom, and then how the part two was how well you, they thought they, would, they could do them. And I found that the students said uh, after the survey that they uh, didn't feel that they could write long pieces of uh, text in English, and they also didn't like that. And also speaking for a long time, they didn't like or they, didn't, they couldn't do well as well. So this is why I, I started a number of uh, things, the speed writing being one of them, the um, uh, lots of other activities related to speaking uh, for long periods of time was another one of them. And towards the end of the term, uh, when I actually um, surveyed them again, the results were really positive uh, on the whole, and a lot of them had changed their attitude towards writing, for example, or speaking for a long time. They enjoyed it more. They didn't feel it was such a burden. And I'm sure that the activities and this gamification that I started in class certainly helped with that. Um, okay, I'm going to move on now to um, something that we put in the book, which is our book was very clearly divided into um, different sections appealing to teachers depending on what they had available. So in other words, teachers who, um, and there are so many of them who don't have access to any computers in the classroom, can still uh, do lots of activities related to computer games. So we suggested lots of um, things that were just discussions. So the idea was that a teacher would actually bring in the subject of games, especially if their students uh, were playing them at home, uh, to at least get them to talk about it. And here are some on the screen, some ideas of that. So in other words, uh, guessing what game they, they were, they are, um, talking about or writing about their favorite games, or talking about different characters or other activities related to games. So that was all about employing the idea of games uh, and, and bringing them into the classroom to motivate the students, which is something that a lot of teachers wouldn't think about. They would think about asking students about TV or films or books, perhaps, that students ha have read or seen, etc., but wouldn't actually, a lot of them, in my experience, talk about the games that the students played, when in fact a lot of students nowadays spend a lot of time playing games, so it's something that certainly uh, a teacher should keep in mind. Okay, now if you do have access to one computer in the classroom, especially if you, if you have a screen that you can put it on, then there are a number of games that can be used uh, to promote speaking. One of them I recommend is called Play Spent. It's basically a game about um, to raise awareness. It was created. It's a serious game. It was created by, by uh, part, uh, an organization in the U.S. to raise awareness about what it's like for people to be unemployed and how to survive on a certain uh, a small amount of money. Um, the interesting thing about it is that it's a reading game, and I created a, a lesson plan uh, that highlighted with the, uh, the different um, aspects of the game. Um, first of all, starting to raise awareness with the students about the background of the game before we played it, looking at the vocabulary in the, in the game as well. And then when playing the game, you, get, uh, you play it together and you get a series of choices. Those choices are often very moral choices. One of them that I remember very well with my students, a lot of them were just, you know, would, where do you want to live? Do you want to live in the big city or further out in the, in the um, uh, towards the countryside? Those were choices that were not very, um, that my students were, you know, could make very easily, etc. 
And then we got to other choices, which was, uh, for example, one of them I remember well was uh, you have family pet um, is, uh, sorry, the, the flat you just moved into, the owner doesn't allow for pets. So you can either give it away to a friend or you can uh, get rid of it, um, etc. And I think one of the things that came out of this part of the game was that there's two types of students, two types of players, if you like. One, the type of player who sees this as a game that has to be beaten, and they were very disconnected from it emotionally, and they were able just to make choices based on what they thought was going to let them win the game. And then the other type of person who was very much inside the game and thinking about their decisions that they would make if this was a real situation. And the, the, um, the combination of having students who had both of those um, attitudes led to some very interesting debates and discussions uh, in the classroom. And some of the students got quite upset, actually. OK, that's one, one, um, one computer in the classroom. Um, which you can use. Um, another activity for uh, this, and also to promote speaking, I think I'm going to show you now, which is all based on something that uh, Jim Scrivener and Adrian Underhill developed, which is called Demand High. Demand High ELT, which is all about pushing learners to do more. And I recommend you check out this if you're interested in trying to get your students to do more than they normally do. So the idea was was to not just accept uh, the, uh, the typical answers. So a lot of the time when you're using a course book, um, you're just not really pushing your students. And the idea of demand high is not to make things difficult, but certainly to push them to the point where they're actually being challenged uh, to do as much as they can. Give you an example of an activity related to speaking uh, with this. Um, there was a game I found which is called R Droppy, which has very small stages. Uh, it's a puzzle game and has uh, a number of 10, I think, stages which were very short that had to be um, that had to be solved. What I did was I made screenshot shots of the beginnings of these stages. So here's the first one. And I showed them to the students. And I asked them, I gave them 30 minutes, sorry, 30 seconds or 45 seconds, and asked them to remember as much as they could. Uh, so I went through a number of these, not all of them. So there's another one. And I asked them to look at the pictures and remember as much as they could, and then um, moved on to the next one. And after I did that, um, there's another one. I'm just going to move on very quickly through these, actually. Um, then I asked them to talk to their partner and remember as much as they could about each of the five, six pictures, whatever uh, it was I chose to do in the class. And then in their groups, I asked uh, one of the pairs, for example, or one of the groups to um, to talk to me and to describe as well as they could one of the pictures. So, for example, this is what I would ask them to do first, to describe their partner, and then I would ask one of their pairs to describe to me. So that what would usually happen was that the student who had volunteered would start describing me. So if you remember the first image, they would say, OK, there's a man or a woman. Uh, he or she is on a horse. Uh, it's hot. It looks like it's a desert. Uh, one of the great things about this type of activity is that the students would be able to um, talk at the level, at their highest level. So it can be used with any type of um, student at any level, if you like. So the basic students will say very basic things, and the more advanced students can say a lot more sophisticated things. So what you do is you then give them points. You award them points. So again, we're back to the points thing. 
I give someone 10 points for a basic description. And then I would ask someone else in the class if they could describe it better. And normally they would start by saying, OK, well, the man wore yellow and the horse looked. And then I would say, no, 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 not adding things to the picture, to the description of the picture, but actually saying it better. So starting from the beginning. So I'd actually have, have them describe the whole thing again in more detail. And if they were able to do that, I would give them more uh, points than the person, the first person who started. So this was pushing them to better the descriptions to the point uh, where they could. And uh, because they were getting points for it, um, they would try harder. And they would try as hard as they can to express themselves at the level uh, of their language. Um, so really, this is using a game, uh, but it could be with photographs as well. The reason why it was useful to use a game is that there was a second part of this, which was then I would look at the last stage of the each of the micro games, the mini games, the puzzles had been solved. So in other words, you've got here the second picture. So this is Droppy, if we call the person Droppy, on the, how, on the horse. Um, he now has a hat on, so he's shaded, and perhaps they've drunk from the uh, cactus. And then they would have to say what happened, what has happened. So they would have to, uh, the students would have to use the present perfect to, to, to start to say a sentence. And also, at the end of this, if we wanted to, we could move on and let them, I could I'd let them play each um, part of the game as a little reward. But that game part was something that they could actually uh, do at home uh, for homework. So it was something that if we ran out of time at the end of the class for the game, then they would do it at home. So the idea behind this is having a before and after photograph or image, which was easy with these puzzle games, and to push them to speak as, as best as they can. And if I was in the same physical space of you as you are when you're in this activity I would actually ask you to to do it and here are the results that I was speaking about before in one of the classes that I started to do this that the um, the attitude to speaking and writing went up okay now games can also be used of course if you have access to a computer room so you have multiple computers then there are lots of ways that you can use games Here's um, a game I recommend. It's called Heberdale. Uh, it's a story, and again, it's full of little puzzles. Um, you take the role of this Dr. Heather Montrose in the heart of Africa, and you're looking for a mysterious hidden city. Now, what uh, you can do to practice language um, when you have this type of game, there are a number of things you can do. One thing is that you can have the answers to what the students have to do, and then you can use it as a live listening. So you can almost dictate to the students all of the things that they have to do, and they have to then understand what you say and do it while playing the game. And the only way that they achieve the puzzles is if they've understood what you've said. So that's um, uh, almost like a live listening comprehension which is useful because you can then, at an instant, walking around the classroom, see which of the students have accomplished, have understood you, because they're the ones who have actually done what you've said. And the other ones who haven't understood you haven't done that, so you can spend more time with them. Now, with this particular game, you can also play it in other ways. One of the ways that uh, I did, again, was to maximize the kind of language that you get from students playing games is that you actually play the game, uh, you don't play the game in in a lot of time, you actually do uh, the language work before playing any of the game. Um, and that way you can maximize the language that you get out of each of the games. All right? So here are the instructions. Um, I'll just briefly summarize it for you. The idea is that I gave students a list of the objects that uh, they needed to find and combine, because that's essentially the nature of this game. So let's move on to the list here. 
So for example, a hairpin and a shed, we've got a lot of interesting vocabulary here. And uh, you might think that it's not very, um, not vocabulary that the students might come across uh, normally. However, if your students play games, then this is exactly the kind of vocabulary that they would come across and would need to know. Um, so the hairpin and shed, and what they have to decide before we play the game is what, how they, what the connection was. So no, what is the connection between a hairpin and shed? And again, if I was in the same room and I could actually see you now, then I'd actually ask you for five minutes or a few minutes to discuss some of these and work it out. Of course, the hairpin you would use to open the lock of the shed. Okay, there are, there are a few here that are difficult. Some of them are more um, easier. For example, the guitar string and the broken crossbow. Well, you'd use the guitar string to mend or to fix the broken crossbow. Um, and that's how they would go on. Once they'd decided what to do with each one of these, and I would go over it and um, and help them with it, then they'd play the actual game. These games, um, what helps a teacher to prepare um, this is that you should be familiar with the game yourself, but you don't actually have to go through a game and work out what, how to fix the puzzles. What you can do is you can use the magic word, which is walkthrough. If you find a game such as Heatherdale and put into Google Heatherdale walkthrough, you actually get the instructions of how to beat the game. Um, this is something that you can do to prepare yourself. Um, you can print it out so you can actually then tell the students what they need to do. Or you can actually then use the walkthrough, which usually are all, always in English, uh, to prepare an activity for the students. So you can prepare it as a reading comprehension, for example. The types of games that I recommend are all free uh, online. Again, if you don't have access to them in the classroom, if you don't have a computer in the classroom, but your students have computers and the internet at home or access to them outside of the school, then uh, the type of game I recommend is called an escape the room game. These are all puzzles, and as the name uh, the name suggests, the objective that you you have to do is you have to escape the room. You're trapped in a room or a house or several rooms or a building, and you have to find your way out. And it always um, it, it's a kind of series of logic puzzles, or you have to find various things and work out how to combine them in order to escape the room. Um, they can be adapted for many, many, in many different ways, depending on what you want to practice. So here's a gap fill for vocabulary and grammar. And as I said all before, all of these lesson plans for these games can be found on our blog, Digital Play. So here's an example um, of how you would ask the students, you would give a worksheet to the students and then ask them to either for, for homework or in class if you were in a computer room with them to do various things um, and they'd have to um, they'd have to use them. They can be out of order. It's a bit of a reading as well. This is a relay reading so um, we've used this in a classroom with another game called Space Quest and you have the one sheet of paper uh, for you know one side, one end of the room where the students working in pairs, one of them would be at the computer trying to play the game and the other student would have to go and read the first instruction and then run back to their partner and tell them what they had to do to be able to move on in the game. It's quite a fun way of doing uh, relay reading or reading dictation, if you like, running dictation with a game involved in it which always goes down really well, again, with teenagers or preteens. Then there, of course, there's jigsaw reading, and this uses a game called Motta, so Mystery of Time and Space, which is quite interesting because every time you move your mouse over one of the objects in the game, the name in English comes up, so you can see the mouse has moved over the locker there. Um, it's a very, it's a classic uh, Escape the Room game, and here the instructions we gave to the students uh, out of order and they'd have to work out what to do, in other words, how to uh, put them in order 
um, in other in order to um, to be able to leave that room. Uh, one of the things you'll find with the language in the walkthroughs on the left as an example is that there was a lot of clicks on it. So one of, one of the things we started doing was rather than um, using the walkthroughs as they're uh, written uh, and as you find them on the internet, you might want to decide to change the clicks. Uh, as I said earlier, there are two ways of playing a game. You can play a game thinking that you're outside using a computer and playing the game, or you can play the game feeling that you're the character inside the room. Now, if you're playing the game on a computer, then the language that you would use in these walkthroughs, which is normally the language which people use in the walkthroughs, is click on this, use this, do that. Okay, but if you put yourself into the game, then of course it would be, um, you know, lift the pillow to get the key, um, open the box or take out the box at the bottom of the locker, um, uh, take the poster of the girl from the wall, um, etc. So you can rewrite these verbs in particular uh, so they're more relevant to the real world of um, putting yourself as the character inside the, um, inside the game is the key to doing that. Then, of course, you have a typical information gap. And here's um, a great game called Samorost 2, which is all about an alien being kidnapping a dog, and you play the character who then chases the aliens to rescue your dog. It's a very fun uh, game, an award-winning game with wonderful graphics and lots of uh, interesting puzzles to solve. And here we put it as a as a gap fill, so the students have to guess and write in uh, the answers as they're playing the game in the computer room again, an information gap. The live listening I've already um, suggested to you as an activity. Uh, so the interesting thing about the live listening is you're talking to the students of how to walk through the game, then you can actually um, change your language to suit the students. So again, you can do this with lots of different levels of students. So you read the walkthrough which you have and use the language that the students would understand, making it more sophisticated for more uh, advanced learners. Then of course you can ask the students to observe what's happening in the game and to write, uh, write instructions. So essentially for them to write the walkthrough as they discover what happens. You might want to do this with the students at home because it would take longer, it would take a long time for them to do that in the in the computer room, unless it was a simple game. Um, again, you can write it as an observation of vocabulary. Here's a, another uh, escape the room game which involves you escaping a bar. Um, and you're asking the students just true or false uh, questions here. The, the clues to playing the game are actually embedded in the uh, in the true and false questions. They highlight various objects that the students click on to find the clues to observe the vocabulary. Watch and say is another one. So um, here's one that uh, can be played. Uh, with one computer on the big screen. Now you're controlling the, the, the game and you would ask the students, you would ask them questions. So you would actually ask the questions, what should we do? Or, you know, think, assuming that, should we stay in or go out? And then based on their answers, you would uh, follow the instruction, you would uh, play the game. Should we listen to some music? Shall I, shall I open this box? Shall I take this, uh, this key out of the box? What should I do with the key? It doesn't have to be yes, no questions. You could make them information questions as well, etc. And that way you get the students to uh, use language together um, to tell you what to do. Um, listening and questioning is another one, uh, similar to what I said before, uh, but more open-ended answers. So here's another game, Bamba Snack Quest. Uh, so you, you're talking the students through what's happened in the game and 
and asking for them to suggest certain things. And if you know what you need to do, then you can tell them, no, that's not a good idea, that doesn't work, or you can try things out in the game as you're going through. Um, finally, coming to the end uh, now, and then hopefully we have some questions or I can uh, talk about something else. Um, you have to think very carefully about a number of procedures and practicalities when you're using games with students. One of the things you have to take bear in mind is the learner grouping. Are you going to use pairs of groups uh, depending on where you are and what kind of things you're doing? If you're in one classroom with one computer or in a computer room, um, you really want to talk, think about how best to maximize the language practice, of course, so the students are actually spending a lot more time uh, speaking or practicing the language than they are playing the game. The whole point here is not that you're giving them uh, a game to play. You're using the game solely to to get a lot of interesting language practice or language output out of the students. One way of maximizing that is to use handouts. So you've seen some examples of, of handouts uh, that we prepared. You can download a lot of these for a lot of games from our blog. And the idea is if you're going to prepare your own handouts for to help students play games, then you should think very carefully about the instructions that you're giving them and the task. You want to make sure that they can understand what they're supposed to do to minimize the amount of um, time wasted while setting up the game, etc. Uh, you should use a game guide, as I said before, which most of the time is called a walkthrough. Encourage use of English, of course, when, you use, when they're using the computers. And you can let them explore, examine, and pick up objects and stuff like that, uh, because that's part of the fun of the game. You shouldn't just tell them what they have to do. If you are doing a live listening, for example, you can pause and ask. You can have a look to see if any of them actually discover what needs to be done, and then you could stop and ask them to tell everybody else what they did to solve that part of the puzzle. So pausing the game, don't be uh, afraid to do that, and ask the students to stop what they're doing and reflect on the puzzles reflect on the game, do they like it, Would it could it be better, etc. Um, as I said before, those who solve any of the puzzles can tell the whole class about it. And then afterwards, one of the things you can do to make use of the time that they've, they've actually spent playing the game is, is ask them to discuss what they've done. And um, a lot of these puzzle games, um, you can get them to make it into a story. So you can ask them to um, to write about how it was that they came to be trapped in that room and what happened after they got out, etc. So they can build a story around the bare, bare, bare bones of the game. Um, and I think it's important also to, to try and make it as authentic uh, as possible. Moving on, um, you can also gamify classwork or project work. One of the things I did was based on a, um, on a, a very popular project of an island, and there are lots of resource books that um, do that. I have the students in groups to create their own islands, and you can see this is an example on the right of one of the students' created islands. Um, and then I created an island in the middle. So the students, then we did project work based on their islands, so I got them to talk about the population of their islands, the geography, uh, what people did, what the experts were, exports were, what kind of tourists came to the island. We also decided on a uh, system of government for the island. They also designed. Okay, can you hear me, Graham? I don't know, but we have something there. Yeah. Well, it's great to have you here. Yes, it's me. So I'm so happy you are here today with us. You are sharing from your way, right? Because he was my master. I mean, he was my mentor. He was the one that was uh, training me in technology. So I really appreciate Brandon is with us today. 
because we met, uh, I don't know, in 2006 or seven, something like that. And uh, it's an honor for us to have him here today. So he says in technology, we're very proud to have you. Uh, and I don't know if they have some questions. I'm sure they, they have questions. I want to ask you some questions, but I don't know if we have the time.